Uh, integrating with Design GIS, we'll talk about Utility Data Hub. First, I want to just show my uh, flight path to land to Denver here. You know, circled around seven times for a total of 90 minutes. It was very interesting. So, myself, uh, Paul Gravel, I've been working for SBS for six years now. I've uh, been doing UDHGIS integrations. Probably been involved in the close to 24 projects, plus or minus there. Um, and I'm senior technical consultant, specializing in GIS, and also part of the uh, UDH GIS development team. Today I'd like to talk to you about a solution we did just recently with Hydro One, um, and also talk to you a little bit about Model Mapper. Uh, we introduced Model Mapper three years ago. We haven't had a pug since then, so I'll give you an update on that. And then we'll talk a little bit about integrating with GIS and the key things of bringing GIS into AUD. Um, hopefully I'll have some stuff here for everyone in the room, from architects, designers, developers, configurators, and obviously for the clients, right, to see the, the benefits of it. So let's start with Hydro One. Hydro One was an interesting project because a lot of the components that we did there were things that we had done, bits and pieces, different places, and also a concept that Sergey had been working on for years about trying to get a design container to have a central place to share all of the GIS data. Um, we were able to implement it at, at Hydro One using ArcGIS Enterprise. So the design container is a bit of a conceptual container of, of data. We'll touch on it a little bit more here. And what it does, it just centralizes everything in there so that we can share that data between GIS, between AUD, between any external systems, whether it's mobile or any other systems with them. They have SAP work management that connects to it and, and shares the data. That allows us to keep importing data into GIS, into AUD, I mean, and that data isn't just raw GIS data, but because it's in our uh, GIS enterprise and we have some maps published, we could share all kinds of data as background reference maps in AUD. So instead of just seeing a blank screen, you could actually see your streets, you could see all your facilities. If you're working both gas and electric, you can bring in gas as a background and using electric as a foreground. And same thing with publishing. We could push back into the design container so that it can be shared with a whole bunch of different systems. With Hydro One, we're publishing twice when we push it out. Once for playback, so that playback will use it in, in uh, GIS, but also once in the feature service, which is all the individual features that get pushed there and used by work manager, SAP, to integrate with it and show it in mobile so the field crews can see individual features in the, in the assets. So it's a pretty cool system where the data flows around between AUD into the design container, into mobile, and then back into the design container and can go back into AUD or back into playback itself. One thing we did at... Uh, Hydro One, slightly different than the total model, is we're still reading from the RD, RDBMS, or ARC SDE data to bring in to AUD. However, currently we are working on about six projects where we're using the design container directly to read everything into AUD. So everything is getting read from the ArcGIS Enterprise um, server. Thanks. What's that? Like this? Thank you. <laughs> so, reading, the, uh, reading data from the design container, basically, we read reference maps. So, all the background maps that we want to see uh, that are published by Hydro One. And they publish things like all their streets, their backgrounds, lots. And they also have some special areas to deal with. Um, uh, those are animals and, and stuff, so fauna, to, so they have to do take care when they're doing the construction and their designs. We import in all the mo uh, mobile updates, so they're able to send it up to mobile, take some notes, 
bring it back in, and then we can bring it into AUD. Uh, work order polygons, common discussions that we have with a lot of you guys is being able to know who else is working in my area before I start working with it. So we can bring in all the work order poly polygons of active work in the area, and then you know if you have anyone that's adjacent to you that might affect your, your work. And of course, the GIS facilities. And then when we publish back, we do the same thing. We publish back the features, publish back to playback, and we'll publish also to the work order polygons. One other thing that we're doing at Hydro One that's kind of cool is they get contractor designs that are AutoCAD. They bring them into AUD to do their designs, geolocate them in AUD, and then they can publish those into their mobile. So when the designer goes for their field visit, they're standing in front of a field, but on their mobile, they could see exactly the whole, the whole design that came in from the contractors, see where their streets are going to be and the lots are going to be and so on. So it provides them a lot of flexibility and be able to see everything visually on the laptop, in the field, or on the mobile system. Question? It's essentially we're using the ArcGIS Enterprise for it, but the, as a design container. And conceptually, what the design container is just saying that we're going to build this with these contracts. So if we can share it with external systems, we're going to use that same contract to read and publish. Right? Which brings me to the design container. <laughs> so basically, it, like I said, it's just a conceptual using the ArcGIS enterprise in this case. And the key here is that we are using uh, pre-agreed on contracts between us and mobile, us and asset management, right? So that way there we could share that data, read and write it back and forth. The other thing that's kind of cool with that, by putting it in the ArcGIS enterprise, then internally they could share this data to other systems in their um, organization, like web services, outage management, field services, whatever other services you think might need it in your company, it's the data is available. And of course, we're, we're using playback. The slight difference there between playback with, with a design container as opposed to the playback that we typically use where we push the data into our DBMS uh, database with staging tables, we push it as a feature service on the ArcGIS Enterprise, and that feature service now is available through playback. And we just use the same schema for playback, except now we're reading a feature instead of reading the database. But this is the coolest part about this, this whole implementation. 90% um, of it, now that's a rough number, I didn't do a full calculation, but 90% of this is configuration. What that means is everything was done in some sort of file that is available to the client to maintain and change as they move and, and new requirements come along. So, it's a little bit like what Dennis was saying earlier this morning. It's not that we don't want your business, we want your business, but at the same time, we don't want you to be stuck. If you need a small change, you should be able to do it. And these are all configuration files that can be done. So we're using AutoCAD configuration files for the CUIX, which is all the, the ribbon, and then the WMS layer files are created to show all the background maps. We use, uh, for UDHGIS, we use some XML, XSD, and Excel. That's probably the only place where someone might need to know a little bit of development. The XSD is, is a schema definition, um, but it's still just a file. You don't need to compile anything to make changes. And then model mapper configuration, which we're going to touch on some more in the presentation here. But as you can see at the bottom there, there's uh, eight mappings, and they're all done with the model mapper and they're basically just XML files. And 10% of that was client extension. And what we do with the client extension is we, we used to write custom code in our core to support any type of requirements you guys were looking for. Instead, now what we've done was, is we've changed the definitions of all our core code so that we can easily extend it in the uh, client extension. So we make small changes to code by overriding what the core does. What that means is if ever the core, there's an update for the core, you can update 
UDHGIS and still keep all of your functionality working and you get the latest and greatest from UDHGIS. Benefits there, client can manage the changes, right? It's in their hands, it's all files, it's easy to do. They can do the updates, they can test it in a very segregated area and then push it out uh, to and deploy it to all the different clients. And the same thing if they want to try a new mapping, get some new data from someplace, they can do the same thing, just create it, test it, and then deploy it. And it's just files. So it's nothing to be compiled or anything like that. The other cool thing that came up uh, through Hydro One is a bit more of an AUD thing. Um, AUD rules essentially will not run if you have a uh, behavior of never validate or never resolve, and then the rules won't run. So when we import in, we always set that to never validate, never resolve, because if you're bringing in some legacy data, we don't want new rules to be changing your models and so on. However, for, for Hydro One with the GIS and AUD being a little bit different, we were getting a lot of modeling issues. So to provide the, the end users with some sort of validation, AUD, um, about two years ago or a couple of versions ago, opened up that we can write rules, even though it, the, um, we have the uh, exist, never validate and never resolve turned on as post-processing. So those rules can be run after we do the import and then be able to display into AUD validations. That gives you, as a designer, the ability to see all those, those uh, errors and be able to fix them more easily than trying to guess what went wrong. So it gives you, we were able to write the rules, provide better information so that they can pick the model or figure out why that model didn't come across. Import from mobile, uh, we have in AUD. So obviously we talked about it earlier. We'll be able to import from mobile. They can import from two places when they're doing the mobile. The as-built can come in into AUD if they want to see it, get the notes and get, get the updates to those attributes. Or they also get uh, notes from the field for the designers out there doing um, field checks and putting in notes. So we created a AUD updater. It's basically playback in AUD. Same code, same dialogue, same everything. We just brought it into AUD. And for uh, Hydro One, we can display changes to attributes and we can display the notes. And the very cool thing at the very bottom here, uh, not sure if you guys can see that, but there's a link down there. And let me see if I get my laser pointer here to work right down here. They can get a link because when they're out in the field, they could take pictures, add the notes, take pictures, add notes, take pictures. And then uh, in that design container, we store the pictures and they're available to, to them through AUD. Publishing, uh, same thing. Uh, we're just publishing to GIS, publishing to playback. The feature service, as I talked about earlier, the work area polygons. The other thing that we did there that was very, very cool and, and wasn't sure if it was going to work or not, but it turned out it was, it was a lot easier than I, than I thought. They wanted to be able to push back to GIS any uh, data corrections. So you bring it into AUD, you see some changes that, that aren't right in the field and so on, you want to push that back to GIS. But What's the process? If it goes back to GIS, are we checking things in? Or is, is that the job? So we create a data correction status. And if, the, if you hit the publish data corrections, it dynamically changes the status of the export and looks only for data corrections and sends those to GIS. So that one feature that be corrected or two features need to be corrected, be sent to GIS. And in AUD, the designer would click another button to let the GIS know we got some high priority fixes to be put into GIS and their turnaround is supposed to be one day or two days to get those updated. So all the updates get put into GIS on a quick turnaround. Next topic, uh, model mapper. 
So we introduced Model Mapper about three years ago. Um, I took on the challenge to write the prototype and to test the prototype, figured the best way of doing it is to actually implement it. So we implemented the three projects I was on using only Model Mapper. Well, I spent half my time writing code fixing Model Mapper instead of doing the solution, but I got them done. Um, and the cool thing is I got them done and it proved that it worked and it worked well. So now we got a person, Steve Milligan, working on this that is a product person and he's, you know, cleaned it up, polished it up, made it more usable for end users and more readable. Um, but since then, we've also implemented over a dozen projects using just Model Mapper. Um, and also, we are actively um, you know, adding new functionality and capturing new enhancements from you guys who are using it. And now that we've extended a little bit, because now we've got close to 12 resources using this, we're getting a lot of feedback. Why is this doing this? Why is it working like this? But you guys don't all work like me, like, you know, but everyone works a little bit differently, so we're, we're, we're seeing different things, which is really great because it's making the tool going to be more flexible and more usable for the end users. Uh, and then some clients are actually actually very active in there, uh, Hydro One being one of them. I worked with a GIS person there who I gave him a two-hour course on on Model Mapper, and then he was able to go through Model Mapper and find out where the issue was. So instead of just saying, I'm not getting the right voltage for my transformers, it's a like, Paul, go into the mapping transformer where you're doing the attribute change. I think you have a typo there. And I'd go in there and say, God, you just saved me like two hours work. Thank you. So it was great because he got to know it and my understanding is a second person who now knows it also, and they're going to start managing it and, and, and making whatever minor changes they need at Hydro One. Speaking of Hydro One, that's the import mapping, that's the export mapping. So as you can see, it's, they're not simple. They bounce around all over the place. If you think about GIS, the relationships of data in GIS is very different than the relationships and structure of, G of AUD models. So there's a lot of one-to-one, -one, many to one one-to-many relationships that need to be captured in the mapping, and Model Mapper does support that. And you can join a whole bunch of tables together and split them off into, into different ones. Or if we look at utility network, get a little bit more structured. Import for uh, gas utility network, and on this side here is the uh, export of gas utility network. So the import, as you can see, there's a lot, because with utility network, instead of just importing the six feature classes, we actually go down to the asset groups. So if you're familiar with utility network, they kind of brought everything into six feature classes, you know, uh, distribution points, distribution lines, and then structural points and structural lines, and then a couple other supporting feature classes. And in there, if you look at a gas solution like this, a point in a, in utility network could be a valve, could be a fitting, could be multiple different types of features. In AUD, we separate valves and fittings and so on. So the relationship going from many to many breaks up quite a bit. But as you can see on the export, we are actually writing back into the feature class in Utility Network, so it's a much cleaner, straighter export. And the mappings don't need to be complicated at all. If you look at the one on the bottom, it's a mapping of the work order polygons to be sent to GIS or to be read back. So it's just read the information from AUD and then push it back out. So some of the things that we've added in the past three years are global operations, macros, isolations and groups, search functionality, error logging, and debugging. So global operations is basically a real time saver. If you know that every feature class that you either import or export will require so many attributes to be configured or mapped, you could do it in one global and then just uh, reference that global mapping at each mapping for each feature class. That way there, if there's a change in the name or the change in the syntax, or you don't want to change that mapping, you can just do it 
in what that one location, it will affect all the mappings. And then we got macros, and the macros is the same thing. You can grab everything, uh, two or three, there's no limit on, on the type of transformers, and group them together and just say, okay, reference this macro, reference this macro. So there, again, if there's any changes, you just do the change once, and it'll affect all your mappings. Isolations and groups. Um, it's a nice feature. Personally, I don't use it, but I know some of the new configurators use it. It's a way of grouping your feature classes together. So you could say, okay, group together all my structures, group together all my devices, group together all my conductors. And then you can use isolation and say, show me only the structural mapping. So that way there, the, you don't see that busy configuration that we have here. If we get rid of all the devices in here, you probably have three or four lines. So it's a lot, lot cleaner, a lot easier to work with. So isolation could be done by group or it could be done by feature class also. So you isolate coming from transformers from GIS. What's the whole mapping doing there? And then the search functionality is my favorite. Um, simply because I could find things where I did a whole bunch of typos all over the place because I do a lot of typos. Um, and being able to do the search, the cool thing about it, not only does it give us a list on the right-hand side of all the things I found, but it also, when you click on the right-hand side in the table, it will zoom to that transformer and also highlight the operation so you know exactly where the issue is. Error logging provides you a way to see um, issues when you're trying to debug. And then talking about the debugger, uh, it provides you the ability to run the, a test, essentially. So you've just written a configuration, you know the mapping, you're going to go from a pole to a pole, but is it going to work? So you can put an object ID for a pole or a FID from AUD to, to GIS and run it for that single pole and then to get the results. If your uh, highlight at each transformer is green, that means it passed. If it's red, something failed. And then if it failed, what you want to do is go see the results. And the results will show you what the values were for each attribute pre-transform and post-transform. So you're able to see how that attribute was changed, uh, modified, created, or deleted. And again, if you do lots of typos, this is a real time saver. So integrating a GIS, this, this one here might be more for uh, the configurators to, to work with it, but it's also for the end users to understand why things are working in a certain way. As we know, AUD has you know, some key concepts that we need to adhere to to make sure that when we bring the data in from GIS into AUD, it's usable. Model setting is key. If we don't set models in AUD, AUD basically won't work very well. Almost all of your rules, right, whether it be sizing, validation, uh, model setting, um, styling, and sizing, I think I said that one, um, is, is all dependent on model setting. So if we don't, if we bring in from GIS just data and say, okay, yeah, this is a pole and it's just this, but it doesn't have a model set to it, then it's not usable in AUD until they, you set a model. AUD also has a strong dependency on connectivity. I think someone talked about that earlier today about connectivity and, and containment are key um, concepts that AUD need to be able to run all their rules and be able to order the right materials and so on. So this is a slide that most of you have seen with the AUD uh, training, right? It's just explaining the difference between a model attribute and a, and a feature attribute. And basically model attributes, right, is a version of that design component. As for a feature attribute, it's specific data for that instance. So model setting for us as GIS integrators, we have to make the analysis of AUD models and understand what's in there and how to find a model. Perfect example of that would be like a pole. Most poles will always have a class, will always have a material, and will always have a height. 
and nine times a 10, that's enough to, for us to find the model. So we have to not only analyze all of the features individually and find the right attributes, but then we have to make sure those attributes are available from GIS to bring them in, to be able to find that model. And a lot of times there's, there's a, some sort of gap there. So the analysis also, when we're trying to analyze AUD, our challenge for GIS is having an open communication with AUD configurators because that's a moving target. Their target is moving just as fast as ours is and we're delivering at the same time. So communication has to be very important between AUD config and GIS. So when we do the model setting, after we do the analysis, we go into GIS, we go and look for those attributes. If they don't have the attributes in that feature class, is there a related class that has those attributes? We have to go and dig. It's, it's our job to dig into the GIS or work with the GIS team at, at your utility to find out how do I get this data? Is it available? If it's not available and it's just an you know, off chance that it's not available, then how do we deal with it? How do we communicate it to the customer that we weren't able to find that model for this reason? If it's uh, an occurrence that happens a lot, which unfortunately we had happen at Hydro One, then we provide them with some messaging so that they can easily work with it through uh, AUD. So concepts of containment, uh, anybody who's working with AUD understands that you know a pole will contain the transformer, contain the pole framing, contain the guy, contain the riser. So it just says that there's a relationship between that pole and, and, and all the features. And the same thing with, with connectivity. In AUD, we have two types of connectivity. We have the structural connectivity, and then we have the electrical network con uh, connectivity. And that connectivity is, is key when we're bringing it in from GIS. So some GISs, most of the geometric network GIS, uses you know line, point, line, uh, geometry to be able to do the connectivity. So we could use that and read that and convert it into an AUD logical connectivity. Utility network will have logical connectivity. Um, we can use that and convert it into AUD connectivity. Unfortunately, there's some GISs out there that don't have connectivity, and that's where we have to be a little bit creative, talk with you guys, find out how we want to deal with it. What's the best way? Do we do a spatial query or do we not do a spatial query? What are the risks of doing a spatial query and trying to find anything that's close to create a connectivity and containment? Um, so in the end, you know, when it comes to modeling, connectivity and containment, that's where we have to spend the most of our time analyzing the data and becoming the experts of data between AUD and GIS. And that brings me to questions. Hey, Paul. Hey, Abel. Just wondering, does this work uh, with uh, the Esri utility network or only yeah. or? No. Uh, you mean the container? Yes, sir. The container is exactly what we're doing at San Diego. So what, what, I, what I was talking to you about was for potentially doing for SoCal, same thing. Yep. And the, re the playback manager will work with any flavor of Esri or Small World or GTEC or any spatial. Exactly. Exactly, we got a version for each GIS out there. So, and I didn't have any slides on on playback. Um, so, if you guys do have any questions on playback, please don't be shy. Ask them, and on Thursday we'll have uh, breakout rooms to talk about those too. So. so, one other question. Sorry if I missed this earlier, but what is the difference between the container and UDH? UDH is our product, so Utility Data, data Hub. So it's, it's, it's a, our hub to integrate in general. So you got UDH EEM that integrates with asset management and GIS that integrates with GIS. The, the design container is a, I guess you could almost say a hub, but it's a conceptual container to share with other, other parts. And the difference there is that we, we come into a contract agreement with the other external systems that want to integrate. As long as we have the same read and write 
contract and they have the same read and write contract, then we could share that data. It, the design container is not part of our product. It's the infrastructure the utility provides us for sharing the data. Yes. I can dumb it down. <laughs> Me many times. <laughs> people as well so um do we have any customers who are importing uh, gis data with with 3d you know a z ordinate as part of the the data i'm trying to think because i'm pretty sure we do have energy queensland okay that's it right and and we also have the ability when we're importing to import on top of an elevation model you know so if you actually build the surface Yes. As an FDO attached layer. Are any, are any customers actually doing that as well? Are they? So that surface, are you talking about using the, uh, just an AutoCAD surface with the points, or are you talking about the uh, Google one that we also have? Well, the, w whatever works when okay. you're creating digitizing objects in AUD that will automatically use that elevation right. to put the poles at that point based right. in the real world. So I'm not sure at, at EQL, I haven't, I haven't been totally involved there. Are they using surfaces there? Yeah. Yeah. They're using surfaces as well. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, they got civil, right, to, to, to get their surfaces in? Okay. Because then you get the true sag, you know, the can. Right. But the good thing about the 3D at, at EQL, though, Andy, is uh, I think. Um, Sam worked with Steve, and we actually have it all in the core product now to support it. So if we do have another requirement for it, it's there. So I'll show one, one thing here in just a couple of minutes. When I was talking about containment and con connectivity, a lot of times we have a hard time getting that relationships and, and so on out of GIS. One client we're working with right now, their GIS was very complicated and I actually had a little bit of a hard time talking with them to, to share the data, but we got access to the data. We started looking into it and, and finding all kinds of relationships. And once we started digging into there, we found how their relationships were so well done that it really helped us with the designers because the designers were saying GIS data is too complicated for us. If we bring it in, we're spending a day cleaning this up. It's not worth it. So by looking and analyzing their data, we were able to find out that by having these relationships and through a model mapper, go through these relationships and join things together and using the geometry of one structure and then moving all the lines together, we were able to clean up enough that now they're saying, wow, we could use this. This is usable now, even though it's not properly located, everything's cleaned up. It's just a matter of moving a few features here and there. Let me see if I can uh, get this to start. So what we're looking at here is the GIS. Well, that's kind of dark. So there's multiple lines. There's devices off the poles. So we're just going to do an import here. And it's hard to see, but there's some blue lines off of the, uh, the yellow lines, and those are the secondaries and primaries. And then when we bring it in from GIS, we bring in all the geometry together. So then we end up with a single line to have the segment with with all the conductors contained. So the containment gets all done, even though in GIS everything is separated. This one here is quite complicated. Um, again, there's multiple lines here. This is a downtown underground system that shows you know, a duct with duct banks with a dozen conductors in there. So everything's split out, so they're saying we can't work with that. So now, because I was able to find the duct bank that had the geometry and say, okay, it contains this, this, and this, get rid of all that geometry and just put, put it in that duct bank. So now when we select that one, we can see that segment has all the conduits in it, 
and all the conductors and, and all that relationship is all built. So if the data is there in GIS, we can definitely, you know, munge around and move the, the geometry to make it more usable for you as the designers, right? There's an online question. Yep. What is a typical time frame needed to implement against Arc FM geometric? Typical time frame. That's a good question. Uh, that's more like an Aaron question. <laughs> T typically, though, for uh, our projects, we go, what, six to nine months? So I'll just repeat it because you weren't on the microphone here. <laughs> but yeah, typically about, about six to nine months. And the, the key thing here is it's not just UDHGIS that we're doing. UDHGIS has a dependency on AUD, so the config is being done at that time, too. And also EEM gets done so that it's, it's a full solution. And... That is typically what Pat was saying, six to nine months is to SIP, and then SIP could depend on the requirements for that utility passing through it. Sorry, if the question came from someone who's already has AUD and they're now looking to expand to their GIS integration, that's a much smaller project. That, that's usually three to four months. We could probably do that. So that, you know, what's the timeline? I know AUD standalone. Um, you know, Salt River Project, we didn't, they did it all themselves in-house. You know, we just do some advice on them. But we've done, you know, uh, Roseville, you know, I think yours was a very short project. Uh, you know, Hydro One, which has very complex costing and all that stuff on it, it's, it's you know, it's a nine-month project. So it's, everything's different. But once you have the baseline, we, we expanding it out, you do not have to be on a, uh, fight it all at one time, you know, get AUD and then you can do GIS and you can do EAM, then you can switch your GIS to another GIS. We've had customers switch from Storm to Maximo. We've had customers switch from Maximo to Maximo Spatial. So it's, it's all flexible, it's just everyone's unique. Well, very standardized utility, we just all have our own version of that standard of how we approach it. Hopefully that's kind of one and the same theme, you know, with Jean-Marie starting off today. You all have the same problems. Everyone's facing the same problem. It's just different scales to base it on your business processes that come out of it. For GIS also, because it's so data centric, it'll depend on the complexity of the data, but also if you take a look at a gas implementation of GIS compared to electric implementation, gas will be a little bit simpler. They have less uh, relationships, connectivity and containment and stuff. So the model is simpler, so the, the GIS integration should be simpler. But then again, I say that, and I looked at the SoCal gas implementation of, we, we were bringing in uh, dimensions and so on, so it's, it's really about the data and understanding that first before we can give a hard rule about typical on that.